Melissa. You're a long-term bull on China, but right now you say it might be prudent to be on the sidelines. Why? It's definitely for the equity markets prudent to be on the sidelines right now. Now, when China talks about common prosperity, they are talking longer term, achieving common prosperity by 2035. So to try to time exactly when these regulatory tightening measures are over, I think is difficult. Um, I think you could see this extend further. And they've been very clear, if you look at the five-year plan, at the sectors that they're going to target. That's related to innovation and also to the green agenda. And it's also focused on income inequality. So you could see more measures that are coming out that affect um, the housing market, you know, higher property taxes, um, also more pressure to increase wages, um, given that the level of disposable income in China is still really quite low compared to the cost of housing and many goods. So I don't think this is over yet. I think in the Chinese equity market, you're better to stay on the sidelines right now. You've been a China watcher for a very long time, emerging markets watcher more broadly, Joyce. And I'm wondering if, if there's anything different about this round of reforms, either the cadence of it or the areas it's, it's targeting versus in the past. Well, there's definitely a focus on the new economy, but this is something that we've seen in China before. For sectors that have had very rapid expansion in early stages, China has clamped down. We saw this in the past on the telecom sector. We also saw it in shipping. So this is not new, nor is it anti-capitalist. There are longer-term goals that China is trying to achieve, and they've shifted now to really focusing on consumer and social welfare. So this does mean um, you know, a much greater focus on the cost of housing, of transportation, of education, of basic goods that are consumed as they develop a larger middle class. So I think you're going to see this ongoing tilt. Um, and much like the U.S., the focus is on self-sufficiency, that they want to own their own supply chains. They want the listings um, you know, to be on their own exchanges. And remember also in the last days of the Trump administration, you know, all the proposals about delisting in the U.S., they want to get ahead of what some of these measures could be that could come up in the U.S. Congress um, you know, after we're done with budget reconciliation, the infrastructure and tax package. There are a number of bills that are focused on China that have bipartisan support that I think you will hear more about um, you know, in, in, later in the year. Joyce, you've been right to be cautious. I mean, obviously, since Halloween, these stocks here that trade in the U.S. have not traded particularly well. But I guess the question is, Seemingly, so much has been discounted already in the stocks. Uh, is that a fair assessment, or you see still further headline risk in these names? Well, you know, I think that you're probably more than halfway through this round of the cycle, but maybe you're at the 60 to 70 percent point of it. But what you do see is that the companies in China are trying to react to this and come out with measures that promote common prosperity, given what the long government's longer term focus is. But I still think that there is more to come. You could see this going for, you know, into 2022. Um, valuations are getting more attractive right now. And I think just similarly, looking at their five-year plan, the sectors that they have recommended still have opportunities as well. And so I think the timing is difficult right now. And what we have been recommending that investors do is really stay more in the government bond market for China. And there we have seen this having very little impact. Um, you know, the yield differential is still attractive. Uh, Chinese government bonds are going into the index. Um, we do think that as there are more concerns about growth in China. You know, we have flattish numbers for the third quarter that you could see more rate cuts forthcoming you know, as well. So I think the right way to play China right now is through the Chinese um, local government bonds where we have an overweight recommendation. Joyce, as uh, SEC Chair Gensler has said, the, the clock is ticking for Chinese companies to comply with U.S. regulators' demand for more information, more transparency, and that could be um, more transparency into their books, into their contracts, et cetera, you name it. Is a possibility that's on the table, in your view, that major Chinese tech stocks in the U.S. could get delisted because they don't want to comply with this standard? Well, I, I think that you have seen that these rules that will go into effect on November 1st will require you know, greater transparency and reporting from foreign firms beginning on November 1st. Um, so I think on both sides, um, you see just more of these regulatory measures coming online. And in China itself, it really is looking at regulation at three different levels, at the sector level, at the security level, and also at the cyberspace level. So I do think you know, the U.S. and China are actually quite similar in that they are trying to each assert, assure 
their own you know, self-sufficiency, work on um, making robust supply chains where they're not as dependent on each other. Um, it really has moved from being a trade war to more of a tech and cyber war. And I think that's with us to stay. That is really the long-term strategic full-fledged competition that we're going to see between the U.S. and China. Joyce, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Joyce Chan.